Thank you. Good morning and welcome to Reaching for the Stars, Connecting to the Future with NASA and Hollywood. You know, NAB's show is the place for groundbreaking demonstrations of advanced media technology. And today, we are truly bringing you something that is out of this world. You are here to witness and to be a part of an amazing collection of astronauts, filmmakers, and technology leaders that will take you behind the scenes of the advanced video and cloud workflows that power deep space research, that ignite our imagination about the future in vast areas of science and storytelling, and that create the foundation for the future of space commerce. Today, you will be a part of the first ever live 4K ultra high definition transmission from space and the International Space Station. The first live discussion with astronauts in space at the NAB show. And an incredible gathering of scientists, astronauts, technologists, and storytellers. Such an effort requires great teamwork and there was absolutely a fantastic collaboration between our teams here at NAB, Amazon Web Services, AWS Elemental, NASA, and Christie. We must also offer a special thanks to the military and government conference as they enabled Dave McQueenie's participation today. So, as the saying goes, what goes up must come down. <laughs> what goes up must come down, except, except when what goes up goes into outer space. And that is what makes the first ever red camera to go to the International Space Station so special. This camera was a vital tool used to further our scientific studies and the interests of NASA's space exploration. It recently returned to Earth so it did successfully come down. And I'd like to invite Dylan Mathis and Rodney Grubb of NASA and Jared Land, president of RED, to the stage to conduct a brief ceremony with this vital first UHD camera. In 2015, NASA and RED collaborated to fly a red epic dragon to the International St Space Station. This camera has served us very well and has recently returned to Earth after 437 days in space. And it was replaced by another red epic dragon as and it will help us to continue to probe deeper into the mysteries of space. With Rodney Grubbs, I'm Dylan Mathis. As principal investigators for this project, we would like to present to you the first camera back from space. Thank you. Thank you. I always feel like a hobbit standing next to Jared. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Dylan, Rodney, and Jared. That is uh, very, very cool stuff. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Carolyn Giardina, technology editor at The Hollywood Reporter, to set the stage for the panel discussion including our first ever live ultra high definition conversation with the International Space Station commander, Peggy Whitson, who also just happens to be the US astronaut with the most cumulative time in space. Carolyn, come tell us what to expect. <laughs> Good morning. For the next hour, this panel will look at how NASA and Hollywood use advanced technologies and inspire one another. This includes technologies such as 4K and cloud. Today, we will begin by demonstrating for the first time ever a live public 4K broadcast from the International Space Station. And since this is, a time this is time sensitive due to the position of the ISS, I'm going to quickly hand this over to Sam Blackman, CEO and co-founder of AWS Elemental, uh, for this segment of the session, and then we'll continue with our panelists.
Who's excited? First live 4K transmission from space ever. Let's get right to it. Johnson Space Center, can you do the audio check? Coming. We should hear it in the room very shortly. Okay, here we go. Hello, Commander Fisher and Colonel Fish Commander Whitson and Colonel Fisher. It is an honor for all of us and those online to join you and all of your colleagues at NASA in the first ever live 4K stream from space. What is the ISS position in orbit right now? Eleven seconds. Well, we're just passing over Baja, California, and we're heading in an arc over North America. By the time we finish talking, we'll be over Central Africa. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Before we learn more about NASA's use of Live 4K, I'd like to share about Peggy's exciting achievement that was recently made on the ISS and in space. Peggy, you've made eight spacewalks, and you recently set the record for the most days in space by an American astronaut. Congratulations. <laughs> what inspired you to become an astronaut? just a dream, but when I graduated from high school, the first female astronauts were selected, and that's when it truly became uh, a goal for me. Luckily, I had no idea how hard it would be, and I just worked really, really hard and spent a lot of years getting there, but and a lot of hard work. Uh, but in the end, I, I got lucky, and uh, some of that work paid off, so it was, it's been well worth the journey, for sure. Well, it's an inspiration to thousands of students in the United States and the entire world, so thank you so much. Now, of course, we're calling from the NAB show here in Las Vegas, where next generation broadcast and production technology comes to life. Are there any films about space that have truly inspired you? For me, it was definitely the right stuff as a, as a test pilot who, you know, Edwards was my second home. You know the start where there, he's like flying through the clouds and he's talking about there's a demon that lives on the meter. And then the plane crashes, it explodes, it goes to color. That's just so awesome. And then also space balls because we're basically flying at ludicrous speed right now. Yeah, okay. Amazing. All right. We could watch that microphone spin for a long time. <laughs> so talking back to technology, can you help us understand the role video plays in your space work?
Well, when we're traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, there's a lot of data going by, even just looking at the Earth below us. And because we are uh, traveling once around the world every 90 minutes, and the Earth is precessing underneath our orbit, we get to see all over the world. And, and we're in different places each time we pass over uh, a particular area. And so it is amazing amount of data that allows us to capture some of that in high resolution. But actually inside the space station, we're also capturing a lot of data, a high data resolution uh, for the scientific experiments inside the racks that we have around us. We have many different types of experiments, uh, either cell cultures, uh, microbiological cultures, protein crystallization. We're doing uh, combustion experiments uh, and lots of studies looking at different physical properties. So uh, it's very exciting and being able to capture a lot of data is very important from us scientifically. What do live 4K and Ultra HD help you do on board the ISS in terms of scientific research that you couldn't do before? Well, I think uh, Peggy mentioned a, lo a lot of the reasons, you know, with these new cameras and new technologies, we're able to get higher resolution, higher frame rates, uh, to capture different science for some of our experiments, uh, ultra slow motion uh, for some of the effects that are very short lived, uh, yet very important. So there's a lot of uh, science both on the station, looking at the earth, and I think even more importantly is the inspirational aspect because you know 4k and, and ultra high def uh, actually make you feel like you're there i mean if you look really close you can probably see into my pores right now granted nobody wants to see there but everybody wants to see the earth from this vantage point and by looking down at the earth with this amazing new technology we're able to inspire an entire new generation of explorers so I think probably the biggest impact that these technologies will have is bringing everyone else on the planet to see these amazing sites that we get to see every day and inspire them to push beyond just living on Earth. Absolutely, yes. All right, so the moment I've been waiting for. Can you show us some experiments in space in live 4K? <laughs> Actually, we'd love to do that. And so uh, a lot of these are kind of things that might we do maybe to have a little bit of fun that just because you can do them in zero gravity. So. We're going to play a little ping pong, but it's kind of space ping pong because we're going to use a ball of water as our ball. So Jack's going to build a ball of water here with the uh, using pushing water out of the straw of the drink bag. He's got a little ball of water, and <laughs> we're going to play ping pong. And now we'd like to show you uh, another demonstration. Uh, the next one I think we'll go after will be what we call, uh, actually it's gonna be a, a ball of water, but it's got a little additive uh, put in it. Um, we're gonna add a little Alka-Seltzer to this ball of water and let you see it. Uh, and we're gonna move up close, so we'll get our, our focus up here a little closer so you can see it in more detail. Oh. 
Wow. Amazing. And a little food coloring added to that. And of course, all of these things are happening because of the uh, surface tension plays such a big role, and it's not impacted in uh, zero gravity. Uh, by the forces it is on Earth. So that's a really w a fun way to demonstrate that. Another really interesting thing is something called thin films, and you can do them also here in zero gravity. But we're going to get set up for that one. Okay, so I've got a little bit of water in this plastic bag, and I'm pulling out. Oops, it broke. Stand by. We'll try it again. I may have to let that microphone go. That is a benefit to PRs in space. You really don't have to hold your mic. Okay, I'm going to get the water shoved over here to the side. So I have a very thin film of water here. Okay, and Jack's got a little bit of food coloring. We're going to add to it. One more. It's amazing. Peggy, Jack, I don't know if you can hear the oohs and ahs in the audience here, but it's tremendous. It's just so, it's mind blowing to be watching this in real time. Um, how do you imagine the future of NASA in terms of where advanced imaging technologies will take you next? Say, maybe Mars? Actually, I think uh, advanced technologies are going to be required to go to Mars, and especially advanced imaging. Obviously, it's important to us uh, to better understand where we're headed. Uh, it minimizes the risk if we better understand that in advance. And so all the studies, all the imaging studies from different uh, rovers and missions that we send to Mars before we actually arrive are going to be critical to a lot of the decision process that uh, will occur. You, you control it. <laughs> Get it in focus. Just so fascinating. OK. Well, Commander Whitson, Colonel Fisher, this has been one of the most remarkable exchanges I have ever had. Your insights are fascinating and inspiring. Thank you so much for taking the time to share them with us and the entire NAB audience and thousands and thousands online. Congratulations on all your accomplishments, and we look forward to a lot of live 4K UHD from the space station for years to come. Thank you. Wow.
think about the Stay technology. Tuned. This is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank One you. more round of applause. Thank you to all of the participants at the Las Vegas Convention Center. Station, please stand by. We are now resuming operational audio communication. So the number of technologies that goes into making an exchange like that possible, seeing how the teams from NASA and AWS Elemental have worked together over the past month, the amount of technology from the networks coming down from the space station, from 4K encoders, from distribution over CDNs to thin film displays all around the world, it all builds on itself to make something like this possible. And I know I'm deeply honored to be here today and be a part of it, and I want to thank everyone here so much for taking the time to come and see history in the making here at NAB. Thank you. All right, next up to explain how this magic actually works, can Carolyn come back up to the stage, please, along with the panel that's going to be explaining all the amazing technology to us. Thank you again. So let's just take another moment to congratulate NASA Services, AW Elemental, and NAB on that amazing first look into the future. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes, but first let me introduce our panelists. Seated next to me is Dr. Dave McQueenie, who's Vice President of Corporate Technology at IBM. Next is filmmaker Bernie McDade, former head of content at Discovery Science Channel, and since then she founded Bua Entertainment, which is a creative consultancy specializing in virtual reality. We are thrilled to welcome U.S. NASA astronaut Dr. Tracy Caldwell Dyson. Dr. Dyson flew aboard the space shuttle Endeavour on a long-haul ISS mission and is a veteran of three spacewalks. She has... And she's logged more than 188 days in space. <laughs> Oops. Also with us this morning is Kwaja Shams, Vice President of Engineering at AWS Elemental, and um, also a veteran of uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And last but not least, we have Rodney Grubbs, who is the NASA Imaging Experts Program Manager and chairs the NASA Digital Television Working Group. So welcome, everyone. So as each of you watched that inspiring 4K stream just moments ago, what was going through your minds? What were you thinking about? You know, the thing that occurred to me was in the first moon landing, 600 million people watched that landing on a grainy black and white yeah. television. Yeah, just my I'll start again. When the uh, 600 million people watch the first moon landing on a grainy black and white television, and when I see this incredible technology, just imagine what your children and your children's children are going to, how they're going to experience further space exploration as we move forward, and how that's going to inspire them. And I think that's pretty incredible. You know, because you heard Peggy say herself, it was seeing that moon landing that made her determined to become an astronaut at a time when NASA didn't consider female astronauts. And I think that's an incredible thing. Yeah, and, and I, I would say that um, when, when Jack made his comment about these higher resolutions enabling everyone on Earth potentially to be there on the ISS with them, I mean, they're up there because of the resources of you know, not just one country, but many countries, and the ability for technology to let any of us be immersed there and to be inspired by it and to learn from it, I think is very impressive. And that was what Jack's comment was on the video, and I thought that was perfect. 
Dr. Dyson. Well, I think it just means astronauts have to step up their game because <laughs> you can see everything uh, in uh, 4K. <laughs> so uh, we've really got to be, uh, I, I think um, it was important that Peggy and uh, Jack um, actually rehearse a little bit before uh, performing those uh, demonstrations. But in the same vein, when we're making uh, a video for uh, scientists on the ground to analyze their data. We really got to, uh, we, we get a lot of data, but we also need to be, as astronauts, um, technically savvy and uh, also um, uh, careful with how we set these things up just to make sure we get, we, the data that we collect is the data that they need because uh, you do see everything. <laughs> and are you also a ping pong pro? Uh, yes, yeah, you definitely gotta practice your, your, your serve with that. <laughs> <laughs> He cheated. That's right. <laughs> Just a little. Qu question, Rodney. I know this was enormous effort to put together. Can you maybe um, just tell us a little bit about what you were the scenes to get here and then what you thought when you watched it? Well, my thought was, um, wow, am I glad all this is working. <laughs> um, so we, we've already seen in the last five minutes doing live television isn't easy. Try doing it in, uh, with, with brand new equipment and so forth. So uh, we've got a great team and seeing everything come together. Uh, three months ago, we drew all this stuff on, on a whiteboard in Houston, Texas, and I took a picture of it and sent it to some very smart people, and here we are. Wow. <laughs> so, what was the most challenging aspect of the effort? Well, as a, as a technologist, I was inspired by the fact that we now have you know, this technical feat of 4K video coming from space. But as I watched the video, I learned that I found my own passion for space reinvigorated. And I realized that the video is just the vehicle. It's the content that I'm most excited about. When you see space ping pong happen, and you see how it inspires the younger generation to you know, just wonder a little bit more about what really goes on in space and aspire to get to space faster. I think that's what I'm most excited about and that's what goes on to my mind when I watch a video like that. Yes, okay. So um, now IBM has actually been involved with NASA since the beginning and uh, as many of you probably saw in the film Hidden Figures, um, IBM's computing power and the innovators behind it have played a big part. Um, Dave, what inspires continuing development of cutting edge computing systems. Well, you know, in the, in the movie Hidden Figures, the, uh, the techies in the audience will probably remember a discussion about you know, the, the orbital physics of, of an elliptical orbit of a spacecraft um, orbiting, transitioning to a parabolic orbit or you know, kind of a trajectory through the atmosphere. And at the time, they didn't have a closed form mathematical solution to that, and so they had to model that numerically. And at the time, a computer was a job title, not a machine, right? It was the human right. folks in that movie uh, that we were so inspired by. And, and it was that connection of those humans to the mission. And you remember the astronauts in the film, they placed their trust in those computers, those human computers. They knew if, if they say it's right, then we're willing to bet our life on it. So that, that connection between humans and technology goes back that far. And I've talked to some of the IBMers who worked on the Mercury and Apollo program. Uh, Homer R. is someone I met uh, recently at an event we had marking an anniversary. And he told me at the time, as much as we needed you know, rockets and, and ballistic trajectory, mathematics and everything else, we needed compute power. Those, those programs didn't work without compute power. And so the IBM folks that worked on those missions knew that their innovations, beyond anything they had done before, were literally going to be necessary to bring a spacecraft back from orbit or to get a spacecraft uh, to the moon. And so there was, again, that, that inspiration of the technical challenge and the power of the human and the computer. We saw it again when we played chess against Garry Kasparov with the deep blue chess machine. And, and at the time, we knew that computers were capable of much more than just adding up ledgers and doing payroll. We knew that computing could, could impact the front office of business. And we looked for a way to demonstrate that to everyone. And so we played chess against Garry Kasparov. And again, it, it inspired people at a level that totally surprised us. Um, we did it again with the Watson technology. We put it on TV uh, playing Jeopardy, where we said, you know, computing is now not just at a point where it can do front office business stuff. Computing is at a point where it can start to have a, a small understanding of human language. You know, most of our clients, 80% of their data is unstructured, and they get not enough use from it. So 
That was a way of showing people, here's a way that we can teach computers the knowledge of a human expert at a, at, at a modest level and actually take this vast uh, array of data that's underutilized and start not only getting insights, but to interact between the human and the computer in the human's language rather than the computer's language. So we call that cognitive computing, and it's that inspiration of that Jeopardy match has led to dozens and dozens of very interesting real-world applications of this technology. It's opened up um, all kinds of vistas for, for future innovation. And the, the last comment I would make is, now that we've learned to use all this formerly dark data, now that we've learned to impart some human intelligence uh, to a machine to augment a human's expertise and to converse with the human at a natural human level with these cognitive technologies, we now find ourselves wanting even more compute power. And so one of the other things that we've done recently is we've taken one of the world's first quantum computers, or just a five qubit quantum computer, and literally put it up on the web so that anyone on the planet can submit programs to run on that. And we've had hundreds of thousands of programs submitted from people all over the world, some original scientific papers written as a result of these early inquiries, and it represents the next enormous shift in compute power because instead of building computers out of atoms, we'll actually use the properties of those atoms to do computation, so kind of turning the tables uh, on nature. And, and the inspiration that happens when the humans and the technology interact that way is, I think, what propels everything forward. Mm. Fascinating. We're going to move to Quaja. Um, so as we, we go in that direction, um, substantial engineering challengers are involved in bringing 4K to the screen space to our screens. Can you talk a little bit about those challenges? Sure. Um, we got to participate in some of the challenges that people at NASA are dealing with on a daily basis. So we got a little glimpse into that as we worked through this. When you're sending equipment into space, it has to conform to, you know, the equipment has to be durable because the deeper in space you go, the harder it becomes to replenish hardware. Um, when you're sending equipment into space, you have a tight power and heat dissipation budget, and you want to make sure that you're remaining under tight constraints because you don't have an infinite amount of resources. Um, and it has to be durable so that uh, you know, it, can, uh, it can work through uh, harsh radiations and, and other exposed uh, elements that you have in space. So that's just one part of getting something that is up and re ready to be transported into space and can continue working. After that, the challenges are getting the data back from the space station down to Earth. And fortunately, NASA has spent decades perfecting that technology, making sure that we have the maximum amount of bandwidth that we can possibly get, minimum amount of latency, highest possible resilience, because that's our lifeline to the station, and we want to make sure that we can get that data. Since that pipeline has already been built, we were able to just stand on their shoulders of NASA and get the 4K video stream down to Earth. So that's the first mile problem that NASA made really, really easy, or at least you guys made it look really, really easy for us. Then there's the middle mile and then the last mile. The middle mile is making sure that for a live event, you want to make sure that you have highly resilient infrastructure because you know, there's a lot of people tuned in watching at the same time, and you don't want to do anything to compromise their experience. You want to make sure that you, know, you have the highest possible quality, video quality in the stream that's being processed. You want to make sure there's no disruptions. You want to make sure that despite the fact that there are viewers at home that have varying internet bandwidth, they can still get the maximum possible uh, number of pixels on their screen so they can see and experience this content in the highest possible resolution. So to deal with some of those challenges, you know, we provisioned each of these things inside you know, a, an elastic cloud inside of AWS. We, you know, to make sure that they're resilient, we try to keep these things in running in multiple data centers. We place the content across our edge points of presence in CloudFront to make sure that the data is becoming closer and closer to the end user so that we can maximize the bandwidth and minimize the latency and give them the ultimate possible immersive experience to view the space station. Fantastic, okay. Now Bernie, you produce science documentaries as well as TV and features. What impact do new technologies like 4K and virtual reality have on the sorts of stories that you can tell now? Well, I would say the advent of 4K and virtual reality is probably the most exciting time to be in storytelling since we transitioned from radio to television. Not that I remember that personally, I hasten to uh, um, You know, right now we buy a ticket to go to the cinema to watch a story unfold in front of us, and this technology is gonna allow us very shortly to go to a cinema and be in that story that's unfolding in front of us. 
And I think the gifts of um, 4K and VR are twofold. Firstly, it democratizes experience and it also promotes empathy. And what I mean by democratizing experience is that regardless of your age, size, physical ability, we can take you on a journey to discover this world and beyond to other worlds. And um, you know, so pretty soon, I won't have to go through the rigorous training and be as smart as Tracy is to be an astronaut. I can just pop my goggles on and how marvelous is that? <laughs> um, so I think that's a, a real advantage. And of course, with empathy, um, I think particularly in the current political climate, it would certainly help uh, to allow people to step into someone else's skin for a while and see what their experience is on a daily basis. Um, you know, so as we forge forward into the future and hopefully to colonize other planets, perhaps if we come together as a population on this planet first, then VR and 4K can play a role in that. Okay. Um, Dr. Dyson, what role does uh, Live 4K Cloud um, play in your work, gathering diagnostics and experiments? I think on Orbit, it's becoming more and more useful as it is important because as the station grows in terms of the investigations, the scientific investigations, we astronauts have um, fewer, t fewer um, opportunities to uh, really dive into the actual details of the science that we're setting up and helping to produce data. So having 4K and the cloud, the ability to bring this uh, work down in high definition allows the investigator to really do their job and to be able to see the detail that we perhaps would miss in trying to relay this information to them otherwise. And so I think um, the, greater we, um, the greater our capability in bringing down definition in these scientific experiments in particular, the, um, the greater ability that the researchers have on the ground to use the data that we're collecting for them. Um, are there any specific examples that you could give of something that you're working on right now in using this? Um, well, so when I was up on orbit, we had an experiment called uh, CFE, and it was critical fluid um, uh, dynamics and using shapes of vessels to um, propel liquids um, from point A to point B. And it has its application in fuel tank design for spacecraft, where you could, um, you could propel fluid without any kind of moving parts, which is very important when you're trying to reduce mass on a spacecraft. And one of the most important components of setting up this experiment is the video camera. And if you were to walk into mission control uh, during one of these experiments, you would see very huge um, uh, apparatus, um, which was actually really this big, but it's blown up huge on the screen, and a timer. And then you would hear the principal investigator in the background with all his oohs and ahs and, and excitement over what he's seen through the video. And so I can only imagine 4K, what that would be telling. And, and that's, that's even without all of the timing data and the dimensional data, but just what he's watching through the video um, and is being um, uh, transmitted to him in, in a level of uh, information as well as inspiration. That's just one example. Fantastic. Um, now, Rodney, NASA has achieved this technology first today with the live stream in 4K from space. What lies ahead? Can you talk a little bit about the role that live 4K in the cloud uh, will play as humans move farther from Earth and toward Mars? Right. So there's a lot of components to imaging from space, right? So uh, part of it is the compression. So we used H.265 compression today for the first time. And uh, bandwidth is very precious, even though we've increased the amount of bandwidth we get from the station. As we start moving further out uh, and start putting human presence around the moon and then start talking to go to Mars, that amount of bandwidth that we can get back from the spacecraft gets smaller and smaller. So if, uh, as a technologist and somebody interested in having compelling content for filmmakers, we need to, uh, if we're going to do 4K when we go back to the moon, uh, or the moon area, the cislunar space, uh, I've got to fit that into a smaller pipe. So uh, the compression was really important. Um, better pixels, more pixels, and uh, being able to uh, um, down select a frame or a segment inside a larger uh, space in the image uh, is also very, very valuable. So as we go from 4K to 8K, uh, maybe someday, uh, sooner maybe uh, than people might think, 
Uh, what that actually lets us do is shoot a very wide field of view and still have extremely high resolution in a smaller part of it. So there are a lot of aspects of doing demonstrations like this that are going to get us ready for the kinds of things that we're going to be doing, hopefully, in the not so distant future. Mm -hmm. So from, from here, what are some of the next demonstrations and uh, tests and things that you'll be working on? Well, one of the things that uh, we've talked a little bit about VR, uh, one of the things that we're interested in VR technology for is uh, right now on the space station, on the outside of the space station, uh, we have pan tilt cameras. Um, these, these units were built over 20 years ago, and they're very, very heavy and very clunky. And uh, it, everything you take in space is precious. Every pound that you take is precious. And so simplification and making things smaller would really pay off, uh, particularly if you're in cislunar space and you've got uh, proximity operations of a spacecraft approaching, for example. So if I can get the functionality of pan, tilt, and zoom, by oversampling and having a VR camera with no moving parts, I've solved a whole bunch of problems for us. We don't have to launch this big complex device that's heavy, that points the camera around, and what if there's something going on in front and something going on in the back? Uh, with something like that, uh, we would be able to get a lot of detail and have um, operators on the ground looking at everything around them with no moving parts. Mm. So uh, can you elaborate a little bit on what's, what, what's up there right now and what are you using? Our well, the most advanced uh, motion imagery camera is the one we just saw used right there, the Red Epic Dragon. Right. Day-to-day uh, -day cameras are routine um, HD cameras. We have a Canon 305. Um, these kinds of demonstrations usually result in more and more um, of the next thing, right? And so uh, the natural progression would be more and more UHD 4K and use of H.265 so we can get even more streams down to the ground. Um, we have a few things that we're trying to do in the next few years. You're going to start seeing the space station used as a laboratory to get us ready for these technologies as we start getting ready to move to cislunar space. And can I, if I could just jump in there. So I don't know if everybody's aware, but NASA is a huge partner in the filmmaking business, and they're huge collaborators. And oftentimes, they will supply exceptionally high-level, high-quality footage uh, for films. I made a series called Secret Space Escapes. And frankly, the NASA footage was uh, HD, and it was the highest quality we had from the International Space Station, which is pretty incredible. So when Rodney told me that they were looking into putting virtual reality cameras on the ISS. Like that's an enormous resource for film producers mm -hmm. too. And of course, in turn, that's how you inspire people to move forward. Um, you know, whether it's to become scientists or just to be, you know, donate to the scientific cause. Um, so it's all like, you know hugely positive. I love the author of the Little Prince said, "If you want to, if you want to be an explorer." on the great sea, don't, uh, don't divide people up to collect wood and buy a ship, inspire them to yearn for the open ocean. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why scientists and filmmakers are such a kind of symbiotic relationship and we kind of feed each other. What was the name of the circle? The virtuous <laughs> circle that we the talked about, the, the virtuous circle. The virtuous circle. <laughs> you mentioned that yesterday and I said, well, no one's invited me to that. <laughs> you, you know, I, pick, I want to pick up on something you said about the, 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 the latency problem and the premium on bandwidth. We saw a really interesting example with the 11 second delay up mm. and down to the ISS. And if I look at you know one of the um, computing revolutions happening today that's often called the Internet of Things, so taking these sensors that are deployed in a lot of the physical world and bringing back a digital image of the physical world that we can then manipulate, you run into an interesting conundrum because computing power growing like this data volumes growing like this, all almost by definition coming from the edge, but then com communications bandwidth growing more slowly, even terrestrially. So the innovations that NASA is going to be forced to make to support spaceflight, of, of a more autonomous computing at the far end, skinnier communication pipes, there will be another revolution in the compute industry that is likely to be led by the folks from NASA, just as you know, in many ways, the original computing revolution was led by programs like Mercury and Apollo. Uh, the big difference, though, to our advantage is, is in the Apollo era, NASA had to invent it. Mm -hmm. Now uh, we can leverage technologists and things like what we've seen and talked about here 
uh, and maybe give you a hint or two of that's really cool, but could you do a little bit of this and right. a little bit of that? And, right. and uh, you know, seeing all this commercial off-the-shelf technology pull off what we just did, we didn't have to invent anything. We right. were just able to leverage right. what you folks build and design right. and but take you, advantage of but it. But your mission inspires, and just the way Bernie was talking about, your mission compels people to gather the wood for the ships in a way like no other institution I've ever seen. I want to also re-emphasize one of the points you made earlier around the higher resolution and the role that it plays. As you go deeper and deeper into space, the longevity of your hardware becomes more and more crucial, right? To get to Mars, you know, it's a nine months to 24 month journey, depending on where you are on the planetary rotations. It is really hard to think about hardware that you have to replace. Even lubricating these moving parts is so much more difficult. And if you can take away that need to have moving parts, if you can have that perspective, one, you have increased the longevity. Two, what you have done is you may not know uh, what you're actually looking for until later. And having that wider field of view allows you to go back and take a look at some side effects or something else that might have been interesting that you didn't think it was interesting at the time that you captured it. But what video does is it allows you to capture these moments into perpetuity so that when you become interested, you can go back look at the data again, to your point, and learn from it again, so. You know, I just, I, I feel inspired to mention this, though I'm, uh, I don't know the, uh, the conclusion, but on spacewalks, uh, you know, we have two cameras on our helmet, and then whatever external cameras that we have looking, that can look at the position where the astronauts are during the spacewalk, and that gives us in mission control an idea of what's going on during a spacewalk. And it wasn't until recently that, um, I believe it was Terry Virts that took a GoPro camera out uh, on a recent uh, spacewalk. And how that opened up everyone's eyes to the, um, the reality of what actually goes on. I mean, we got a step closer to what we actually see through our visor when we're out in the vacuum of space. And I think with 4K, and the considerations that we have to make in order to put things in space that bring back such incredible images, miniaturizing it and making it durable for the um, extremes of outer space, the, the uh, temperature extremes, the, the atomic oxygen, the vacuum of space, and then just the, um, the rigors of um, being in a spacesuit and uh, working around hardware to be able to capture um, the magnificence of being in literally in outer space. I would, I just can't wait to see when we're able to pull all of that together to bring it from the inside of the space station to the outside. What are some of the ways that, um, that viewers can currently watch what's happening on NASA TV and the like? Well, I know that we run live streaming video uh, from what we say, DPC to DPC, uh, daily planning conference to daily planning conference. So the beginning of an astronaut's day to the end of it, there's live streaming video from one of the um, cameras in the module, depending on what's going on that day. Right, there's, uh, there's an external HD camera um, system called HDEV. Uh, my colleague Carlos sitting in the audience uh, is uh, the principal investigator for that. Those are four cameras that are sitting on the outside of the station always looking down. And uh, you can look that up and um, when it has a signal, uh, you can see that 24-7, 365. When it doesn't have a signal, of course, it'll just say we'll be right back, basically, uh, once we get a signal. And uh, we're starting to put HDTV cameras out on the space station. Um, you know, the, the International Space Station was designed and built before anybody even dreamed of HDTV. And so we've had to sort of retrofit some of these systems and the communications that are uh, on board the station to make all of these things work. Uh, it wasn't so long ago that doing internet protocol anything on the station was uh, very, very difficult and impossible. And so uh, now that we basically have an internet in space and we even have Wi-Fi on the outside of the space station now, for people like me, I get pretty excited about that because it means Maybe on a future spacewalk, somebody can leave a camera sitting out there in a spot we haven't seen before, and we can occasionally see that point of view as well. But uh, the NASA television is up on satellite, and it's streamed um, all the time. Uh, there's lots of different ways of, of seeing what's going on. NASA's charter says in its charter, everything that we do is owned by the American taxpayer, and we're to make it available to them in the most practical way we possibly can. And we, a lot of us work very hard to do just that. 
Yeah, and also social media has propelled NASA into people's lives in a way we've never seen before this century. So it's almost, um, you know, they're really leveraging their advantage of this incredible imagery that they have. And then of course, through the advantage of sharing and all that. So it's, it's almost that they're moving from a brand to a lifestyle. So if you are interested in NASA, I would encourage you to sign up for their Twitter account and Instagram account, because it's pretty cool. Thanks for the plug. Thank we appreciate you. it. <laughs> <laughs> Start winding down, but um, one thing I did want to make sure we talked about since is uh, NASA Hollywood is, um, Dr. Dyson, you were a consultant on Ridley Scott's film, The Martian. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Yes, um, I had the uh, honor and privilege of working with Jessica Chastain on her role as Commander Melissa Lewis. She, it was um, all her doing, um, she asked if she could um, go, go to space camp and uh, Ridley rigged it up so that she could uh, visit both JPL and uh, Johnson Space Center and she wanted to meet with a female commander type and I was uh, the lucky one that got to spend a, a day with her in our training facility. And um, to sum it up, she's, um, she's a researcher, Jessica is, and she takes any role that she uh, is given very seriously. She, by nature, she told me that she's, she's more of an emotional person and what she really wanted to do is dramatize her, her character, but what she walked away with was um, this uh, sense of, of um, the, the intensity of the work that we do as, as astronauts. So I felt in some ways um, bad that she had to suppress her inner being, but I was, it, I was admiring her all the, all the more because of uh, the character that she portrayed. I felt not only um, uh, honored the work that we do, but she, it was also very important to her to understand the technical aspect of it as well as the human side of it. And that's what I think that uh, the media and Hollywood in particular uh, does um, in great favor to NASA because NASA's really busy with the, the geeky side of things and we're not always um, at the top of our priority list how to express it to the rest of the world, something that they, that they own and it belongs to them. But uh, through, um, through our actors and actresses, they, uh, they do a very good job of capturing, capturing the human side of it and in fact, um, to Jessica, she asked me as many questions about the technical side of it. What does it take to be a commander? What's your role of a commander on the space station both uh, every day and when the bad things happen? She got really into the details, but then she noticed I was wearing a wedding ring. And she said, did you, did you wear that during your mission? And I said, every day. And so she said, that's great. I want to incorporate that. And it was very important to her to capture the human side of it. And she did that in more ways than just what you saw on the screen, but in pulling all of her castmates together during the filming, uh, she really brought to life uh, crew camaraderie and what really binds the mission together are the people, both up in space and on the ground and in between. So I think a uh, big tribute to, uh, to Hollywood and Jessica in particular. Well, we're, we're out of time, but I just like if one of you can make a closing comment on what um, space and uh, storytelling um, can now bring to STEM education. No, please. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken. What, um, what was the last part of the question? Uh, what it can bring to STEM education. To STEM, ah, STEM, I'm sorry, STEM. yes. STEM. So, um, you know, if you go to the public and you ask them uh, a question about space or NASA in general, almost always the answer that you will get from them is actually a description of imagery. And so if you think back to um, what it meant when um, we got a picture back of our pale little blue dot as, as the Apollo 8 spacecraft went around the moon and they had that earth rise and they grabbed, they said, oh my God, look at that, just grabbed the picture and took those photographs. Uh, how many people have, were inspired by just an image like that? Uh, I want to be a scientist. I want to be an engineer. Look how fragile that blue dot is just from that photograph or those images. And so I think we forget sometimes when we're being geeky just how something simple like a demonstration like what we just saw, there's no telling how many people may have seen that, young people, and said, you know, instead of doing what I thought I was going to do, maybe I ought to uh, pay more attention in math class. Uh, or learn a little more about physics because that was cool. 
right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So again, we are out of time. Please join me in thanking our speakers and also in congratulating NASA, Amazon Web Services, and, uh, and NAB on their demonstration. Thank you.